well-funded laboratory and its director, Robert Kehoe, was a very senior figure in, in the public health establishment. Today, we know Kehoe's name best for his career-long defense of the safety of adding lead to gasoline. Kehoe spent a professional lifetime from his pulpit at the Kettering Laboratory assuring the nation that uh, lead added to gasoline was entirely safe. Uh, of course, that's been thoroughly discredited. The toll of health injuries, of neurological injury, injuries to children alone uh, is, is, from adding lead to gasoline is, is almost incalculable. And, uh, you know, for that, we really can thank uh, Dr. Robert Kehoe. He, he soldiered uh, on lead's behalf for his professional lifetime, and he did so being paid by uh, the Ethel Corporation, who were the makers of tetraethyl lead. The same job that Robert Kehoe did laundering lead's image on industry's behalf, he did for fluoride. Kehoe, along with Harold Hodge, was uh, a leading defender of fluoride safety in the workplace, and he also was a leading promoter of water fluoridation. Robert Kehoe and the Kettering Institute on behalf of industry and the National Institute of Dental Research compiled an extensive bibliography of abstracts on fluoride's toxicity and the role of fluoride in public health. This work was funded by Alcoa, the Aluminum Company of Canada, the American Petroleum Institute, DuPont, Kaiser Aluminum, Reynolds Metals, United Steel, and many other corporate sponsors, as well as the National Institute of Dental Research. If you go into the files of Dr. Robert Kehoe at the Kettering Laboratory, you'll come across the existence of a, of a uh, hitherto unknown entity known as the Fluorine Lawyers Committee. And, uh, and Kehoe worked uh, for the Fluorine Lawyers Committee at the University of Cincinnati, doing their bidding, uh, providing ammunition to the Fluorine Lawyers Committee so that they could defend their corporate clients, Alcoa, DuPont, Monsanto, uh, the U.S. Steel, uh, against fluoride lawsuits. In Robert Kehoe's files, there is a, a, a medical study which was a state-of-the-art $100,000 study in which Beagle uh, dogs were given fluoride to breathe uh, in conditions which approximated the working conditions for men and women in the aluminum industry or in any fluoride industry. What happened to that Beagle study? The Beagle study, Paul, found that fluoride was profoundly toxic to the uh, laboratory animals. The Beagle dogs who breathed fluoride six days a week, just like workers, had stupendous lung damage and damage to their lymph nodes. You'd think that someone would have given that medical information to America's doctors or to the workers who were going to those doctors asking why they had emphysema. No, the study was given to the Fluorine Lawyers Committee and it was buried. The book makes clear for the first time uh, that the selling of fluoride to the American public was done by the, the best in the business, by the father of public relations, Edward Bernays. Uh, Edward Bernays is Sigmund Freud's nephew, and he was a Machiavellian genius, uh, small in size, yet cast a towering shadow over the 20th century. Uh, Bernays understood that there was a liberal sentiment coursing through the 20th century and that if you could hitch your commercial wagon to, to, to that uh, uh, star then you could make your clients a lot of money. In 1916 Bernays had suffragettes march in the Easter parade in New York City holding cigarettes as torches of liberty and uh, he, he, he cooked up that scheme on behalf of the American Tobacco Company and, uh, and, and its director, George Hill, who was paying Bernays' uh, uh, salary. Uh, well, my book uncovers correspondence between Bernays and the National Institutes of Dental Research. Uh, Bernays was asked to come to Washington by the NIDR 
to help create their PR campaign to sell fluoride to the nation. Bernays understood that people have an unconscious trust in their doctor or their dentist and if you can persuade doctors and dentists that fluoride is safe and good then you're, you're, you're uh, able to reach the rest of the nation. People believe their doctors and dentists and that was a way of promoting fluoride for Bernays. Very few dentists are aware that the fluoride in public water supplies is a pharmaceutical grade product. It is in fact an industrial waste. It's the uh, waste from the Florida phosphate industry. In the 1950s, the Florida phosphate industry was being sued by farmers and citizens living near those plants because of the fluoride that was killing their cattle, destroying their crops. You know, the Florida phosphate industry today is prevented from having to dispose of its industrial effluent in a toxic waste dump by the device of shipping that in tanker trucks around the country and dumping it in our water supply. From the beginning, opposition to fluoride has been uh, equated with uh, you know, believing the earth is flat or being against the United Nations. Opposition to fluoride is equated with quackery or, or, uh, or paranoia. Uh, and in fact, that's, uh, that's really a media smear. In 1950, the public health endorsed water fluoridation. Almost immediately, there was a national movement against fluoride, and that was led by Dr. George Walbot. We should all know George Walbot's name. Uh, he was the first physician to warn of the dangers of allergic, fatal allergic reaction to penicillin. Now, Walbot warned, was one of the first physicians to warn of the dangers of emphysema from smoking. He saw in his own uh, surgery, in his, his practice in Detroit, Michigan, uh, that people were coming in with these uh, ailments, unexplained ailments, whether it was back pain or gastric distress, uh, muscle fatigue, uh, headaches, uh, and he figured out that it was low-dose fluoride. That, as with a lot of drugs or chemicals, there's a small subset of people who are uniquely allergic to the chemical, and Walbot realized that it was fluoride, and he performed uh, a whole series of double-blind experiments uh, where people were given some fluoridated water without knowing it, and the symptoms recurred. And very quickly, Walbot's name, rather than being seen as this giant of public health committed to safeguarding public health, uh, somebody who had warned us about penicillin or uh, tobacco, suddenly George Walbot becomes this marginal fringe figure who uh, is, uh, is criticized for his opposition to fluoride and that's something that takes place again and again and again. Speaking out as a doctor or a dentist against fluoride is, is, is the third rail uh, it's, it's fatal to your career. Uh, we don't know George Walbot's name because he was smeared by the Public Health Service for his opposition to fluoride. In 1990s, the senior toxicologist for the EPA's Office of Water said that the cancer tests that had been done uh, on fluoride, where laboratory animals were given fluoride, uh, he said that those results had been gerrymandered, that in fact the equivocal verdict that fluoride was a carcinogen ought to have been much stronger. He said that uh, fluoride given to rats had produced bone cancer and liver cancer and that those results had been doctored to make it look as though fluoride hadn't caused as much cancer. I didn't the toxicology business looking at studies of this nature for nearly 25 years and I've never seen that never ever seen where every single endpoint that was a cancer endpoint had been downgraded I'd seen one or two endpoints argued over usually on a definition of what is a cancer in that particular tissue but I've never seen every one of them downgraded I found that very suspicious Marcus was fired Dr. William Marcus was fired and a federal judge ruled that Marcus was fired because of his outspoken opposition to fluoride.
The first two chapters of the book are, relate the story of Dr. Phyllis Mullenix at the Forsyth Dental Institute. She had helped invent a new technology for studying the neurotoxicity of chemicals. Uh, it was called the Computer Pattern Recognition System. And uh, in, in essence, uh, Dr. Mullenix's uh, technology uh, took uh, photographs or video of animals uh, which had been given a chemical in small doses and then used computers to analyze uh, the patterned behavior or the disruptions to patterned behavior when the animals had been given uh, that, that chemical. While Mullenix was brought into the Forsyth Dental Research Center to study the, some of the chemicals used in dentistry and she was asked to study fluoride and Phyllis Mullenix said uh, I'm not wasting my time with fluoride. Fluoride's given to children, it's good for children, it's been down, r around for donkey's years. I'm wasting my time by studying fluoride. Uh, but she did as she was ordered. And uh, Phyllis Mullenix found that fluoride in very modest doses produces effects in laboratory animals resembling attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. The pattern that we saw it typically is what we see with other neurotoxic agents that are well known to cause a hypoactivity or uh, a memory problem or an IQ problem. When I first presented the results of these studies, um, one of the uh, individuals sitting and listening to the results, he says, do you have any idea what you're saying? And he says, you're telling us that we're reducing the IQ of children. And basically I said yes. She went from being an industry-funded, leading neurotoxicologist at a Harvard-affiliated research institute to being a voice in the wilderness. She has not received any grants uh, nor any academic position as a research scientist since her opposition to fluoride was made public. The Center of Disease Control says that water fluoridation is one of the top ten public health achievements of the 20th century. How can citizens deal with something like that? I question authority. You know, for years and years and years and years, the public health establishment told us that lead in gasoline was safe. We know today that children's brains were damaged, were injured by uh, the addition of lead to gasoline. Uh, you know, the implications of this new documentary evidence, the implications of these buried medical studies which are, which are now in the public domain as a result of my book, as a result of uh, you know, the medical work that's been done by people like Phyllis Mullenix, uh, the willingness to speak truth of uh, toxicologists like William Marcus, the implications uh, of that research, uh, of these new findings, is that something is terribly, terribly wrong and we have been led very far astray and it's time to change but that change will only come as a result of uh, bravery as a result of the willingness to invest time you know I, th I think it's time to to speak up to speak loudly to get organized and to fight for change <laughs>